see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Ladies and gentlemen, dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to celebrate what has been the 2017-2018 season for the Calgary Flames. And I think if there was one thing we were going to put on the tombstone for this team this year, it'd be disappointment. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, let's, uh, well, let's talk about the week that was for the Flames, the week that pretty much killed this season. Yeah, it wasn't a very good week. And... It, it is what it is. It, you, there's not really much that you can say in a positive manner in regards to the Flames this season. A team that the, should be looking to home ice advantage right now is not going to make the playoffs. And it's like, um, what? <laughs> so, yeah, the, not a good, as got, be- not a good week. As bad as this sounds, the highlight of our week this week was beating the Oilers at home one nothing, And, I mean, that's a game we should be be winning by a lot more. Smith made 28 saves, and Goudreau scores the only goal here. I really don't know what to say in this one. I thought, you know, the Flames looked like they had to. Um, the Oilers tried to get under our skin in this one, playing a, a bit of a rough game. And the Flames ended up skating away with the win. It was two big points and a win we needed against the Oilers. I think our first one in like two and a half years. Yeah, and the Flames did a good job of capitalizing on the one defensive breakdown where once again you saw uh, this guy scored the play where Gaudreau was left wide open and like you just simply can't give him time and space in front of him and that, like, it, the goalie's he's not going to save it. doesn't matter which goalie it is. Um, the the rest of the game, I thought the Flames did an adequate job. I wasn't really blown away by anything that they did. I thought that their response to the Oilers trying to goon it up a bit was a little lackluster, a bit. And it seemed like the team, like they were trying to win, but their heart wasn't overly in it. The one thing I will give our guys credit for is our defenseman, I thought, did a good job playing McDavid. Now, it's easy when he's the only guy to play on that team, but, I mean, they effectively, they effectively neutralized him, and I thought all night they were playing really well against him. Yeah, and it, for once he didn't score a hat-trick or something against Calgary, which, hey, at least the, the announcers won't be rubbing that in on CBC every game. <laughs> It was nice to finally get a win against the Oilers, and with that win, the Flames moved within two points of the Pacific Division, at least at that point in the week. And the wheels fell off. (laughs) Then the Flames had a couple days break, and they came back on Friday night to take on the San Jose Sharks, a game that we all knew would be an important one for the Flames. And Kane scored four goals in the Sharks' win against the Flames. San Jose extended their lead to three for second place in the Pacific. And this was, to me, pretty much a typical Flames game this season. The Flames, I thought, started out okay. Yeah, they, were, the they were good. Uh, and even when they got up twice in the second period, they were good. And it's like any time they faced any adversity, they just crumpled. Yeah, I mean, Evander Kane opened the scoring, Brower scored, then Jankowski put us up, then Kane scored, then Goudreau put us up, and I thought after that uh, next LeBlanc goal, they were still okay. And once Kane got his goal, the Flames just fell apart. In the third period, we might as well have not even played it at that point. Yeah, exactly. And I think that this loss especially is squarely on the coaching staff for not recognizing that Mike Smith was having a bad game. When you saw the first goal... And then the second goal, and then the third goal, it's like, uh, this guy clearly doesn't have it tonight. And it's unfortunate that it happened, but sometimes goalies do have bad games. And a proper move, even though it was a tie game, your life's on the line on this game. And you're trusting a goalie that's looking very shaky even though Riddick is the backup, it would have been the better option to go there, and the coaching staff stuck with them until it was too late, and the game was already over. Yeah, I mean, by the time Riddick did get in the net, he played 18 minutes. You know, the game was pretty much over. It was at that point, you know, let's avoid more of a shelling on our goaltender. But anytime you let seven goals in, you've really got to question your goaltending choice. 
Yeah, and it was clear from the get-go with the first goal that, like, okay, you let that one go, but then the second one happens and it was equally as bad of a goal. Right there, it, you have to show some desperation as a coach and to show that the players that you're desperate to win as well, not, oh, it's another day at, at the office, I'm just here to collect the paycheck, who cares? And when you're not doing the moves that are expected as a coach, then it rubs off on the players that, well, if he's not doing what he want, needs to do in order to try to get us to win, then why do I have to put my foot forward to take up the reins? And you could see that the team just basically stopped once it hit 3-3 on three really bad goals. And that's not to blame Mike Smith, you know, and say, oh, the season's lost for him. No, he's he's the only reason why the Flames even were in this season. It's just that night he was bad. And it's incumbent on the coaching staff to realize that, hey, he's not having a good game. Let's not sink the season because of him having a bad game. And it's the same exact story that we saw in the playoffs last season when Elliot was having bad games clearly – in game one, game two, game three, and game four, and the coaching staff just, oh, well, he's our starter. And, you know, and that's the reason why the Flames lost and got swept last year because they didn't recognize that the goaltender was being a sieve. And, like, uh, he gave up so many bad goals last year, Elliot, and that sunk our season. And it's the same story in this Sharks game where Smith had a couple of bad goals against he should have been pulled wasn't and the season's over yeah you know we'll talk about this more I think as we get near the end of the season but not just Smith I think there's a a mentality on this team right now among the coaches and maybe the players too that your position in the lineup depends on what you're being paid and then that needs to go away I think there's a lot of guys here that you know, or having a bad game, or maybe aren't playing as well as they can, and they need to be given limited minutes. Exactly. And, uh, well, we've even seen and had discussions in the past of, like, say, TJ Brody not being utilized properly as a left defenseman when he's always been a right defenseman, even though he's a left shooter. Sometimes players work better that way. And ever since Gullitson's been here... Brody hasn't really been performing as a defenseman at an NHL level. And it's because he's not comfortable on the left side. But doggedly, he gets stuck there. And he gets stuck there. And he gets stuck there. And he sucks. And that's not on Brody. That's on the coaching staff not realizing that, hey, he's not being used properly. And it's been throughout the lineup that players aren't being used properly. And the Flames are missing the playoffs when they should be a contender. Well, we'll get back to that when we do our post-mortem in a couple weeks. But oh, let's I know. Get th- I, I'm just a little frustrated. We all are, that. Matt. I know. Got to have I mean, somewhere to vent, you know. <laughs> that's why we do this, right? No one wants to listen to his vents, so we have our listeners listen. Um, the next game was an interesting one. The Flames went to Vegas again for the second time this year. They took on the Golden Knights in what I thought started as a really good game for the sh- for the Flames. The Flames had a record 20 shots in one season. That was a season record for most shots four in one season or in one period and allowed only eight by the Golden Knights. I thought this, when I looked at this, I said, wow, this is a really good period for them to build off. They had good momentum. Even the fourth line was contributing, which we haven't seen a lot of. And then early on in the second period, the Flames take a bad penalty. Vegas goes up. Uh, two nothing, and this is one of those teams that if you give them some offense, Vegas going to take it. I don't think the Flames played poorly; they just led Vegas back into a game that they shouldn't have led Vegas back into, and it was doing what we usually do: it's well, not responding with, to the physical play. Ryan Reeves took us off our game and making bad putting bad mistakes. Yeah, and like uh, Gullitson after after the game, he was being interviewed, and he said that like when. The players, like when the Golden Knights scored the first goal, the Flames players were champing at the bit to go and get it back. And he and the rest of the coaching staff were saying, keep to the system, keep to the system. 
and then it quickly became 4 nothing. Sometimes you need to be able to read the people that you're working with, and unfortunately, yeah. Well, like we talked about earlier, if they're not sticking to the system, that's up to the coaching staff. So I don't care if you're Goudreau or Monaghan or Furland or Bennett or, you know, Brower. If you're not doing what we're told you to do, then you're not going to do it. You're going to sit down. It's like giving a kid a timeout. You're going to sit down for two minutes, and when you're ready to play by the system, we'll put you back on the ice. Well, it's one of those things that you also have to read the pulse of the room. And, like, if the players are showing emotion and, like, wanting to fight to get back into things you kind of just have to let them do that sometimes and especially like when this team has been trying to show some desperation because the players know that how much this matters and like the season's on the line and then you have somebody yelling at you to not do that it kind of it just, it's one of those things, like how we were mentioning last week about, like, this coaching staff having, like, an HR problem and not knowing how to play the room. And it's... Yeah, I don't know. You're right. There's times to say just go do it, and there's times to say play the system. But if the coaching staff is saying, we want you to play the system, and you're not then you shouldn't play. If that's what the coaching staff has decided, that now is the time we want system play, as a player, you need to say, you know what? Coach is the boss. We'll do it his way. Yeah, and for nothing. For for better or for worse, right? The coach is in charge. You got to do what the coach says. Yep, and the coach is the reason why the Flames are missing the playoffs, so... Well, the night after, I thought we might get some relief. The Calgary Flames, as, as usual now, did the back-to-back Vegas and then Arizona, playing the worst team in the league. And you think, okay, the Flames, after coming off a disappointing night in Vegas, should be looking for some retribution, should be looking for a win, and ended up losing 5-2 to two to the Coyotes. Yeah, and that that's just like the exclamation point. <laughs> like, I, yeah. There are no words. <laughs> like, you know, th- this game was one that was the Flames to win and put them back on the winning track. And it's like, you know what, guys? I I don't believe we really want this playoff run when we put in that kind of effort against the Coyotes. No, and it's evident that the players have given up on the coaching staff because, like, come on. Like, e- each of the three games that they lost this week and heading back over the past few weeks like there is a fundamental disagreement between how the coaching staff is wanting things done and how the players are responding to it and there's no it it is what it is the coaching staff seems to have lost the room and because they're clearly not responding at all because they after that one goal by Vegas they should have been pushing back and they didn't and when they gave yeah. up bad goals against San yeah. Jose they they should have been pushing back and they didn't and the Arizona game we need that game and they lose 5-2 it and I'm not meaning to blame it all on the coaching staff it's just that You can't trade 20 players, and you can fire one coach. It's not nice. It's never nice to see somebody lose a job, but there's you can't really change the whole thing to make it the the coaching staff's way, unfortunately. So if the group of players that you have assembled are not listening there is only one option and it doesn't matter what team you are that it is what it is and unfortunately with this flames team ever since the stick throwing incident after the week after once they've finished their seven game winning streak and heading into that bye week they just it seems like the team just stopped playing for the coach properly and the team's gone on a huge run of 
being terrible. And the thing is, is that if this team was just doing 500, like I'm not even saying doing great, just 500, we'd be second place in the division right now. So, like, it's not, it's just very frustrating because of the fact that, like, if you look at the seasons that most of the players are having, like, Dougie Hamilton's leading the NHL in goals for defensemen. Giordano has 10 goals and 40 points. Brody has had one of his best offensive seasons. Gaudreau's having a career year. Monaghan's having a career year. Kachuk's having a better season than he did last year. There's enough there where it's not like the goaltender's been horrible and that's why the Flames are missing. It, like, there's enough parts there that this team should not be where they are. And so frustrating because of the fact you can see that they have it. It's just not getting translated properly from the theoretical to the actual. You know, we're so close to the end of the year, and even if they have given up on the coach, I mean, you almost think the players say at this point, you know what, boys, let's do it for ourselves. Let's just go out and do it. But it seems like even among the players, they, it's almost like a comedy routine. They keep doing the same thing over and over again, and it's like we're going to get a different punchline. It's like it, it seems like even within you know the ranks of our 23 players in the ice, they can't figure out what they want to do. Like you said, some of them are having career years. Some of them are looking terrible. Like we, It doesn't seem like we can even get a consistent effort from most of these guys. One night you're terrible, one night someone else is good. Like We need to all be firing on all cylinders at the same time. Yeah, and that's where a coaching staff... Like You look at Bob Hartley, and it, you know we both criticize like his system play and all that. But he had the Flames motivated every game, game in, game out. Sometimes they'd lose because, frankly, their system was horrible. But at least they were motivated to try their best all the time and everybody was pulling in the same direction. And ever since Glenn Goldson has been hired, it, it's it, you don't see that last like third period comebacks. I can't even remember the last time that the Flames have had one. Or, like, when they face adversity, like, back in 15, 14, 15, and 15, 16, like, any time the Flames faced adversity, they'd be right there ready to go and get it back and go fight the other team to go get it back. Like, I remember that playoff series against Vancouver in Game 6 when the Flames went down 3 nothing in that game. You knew that if the Flames got a goal late in the first period that they were going to win, and Furland scored, and then they ended up winning. Because there was that never say die attitude with all the players, so you know that they have it in them. Because most of the personnel is still here; like it's not a different team. It's just that for whatever reason, that tenacity has gone from their game, and it's just frustrating to see because of the fact you know that they have it in them to do what they need to do, and. Everybody seems to be on 23 separate pages, and none of them are working together. Yeah, we'll see what happens going forward. I have some thoughts on this that we'll talk about in the coming weeks. I sort of want to do some research and get some numbers first. But, yeah, just it seems like, you know, if you want to be a cohesive team, you only be on the same page. And it seems like we can get one or two lines on the same page, but we aren't able to get four lines all firing at the same time, and that's been a large part of the Flames' problems. Oh, for sure. And, you know, there are some parts that the Flames do need to address in terms of personnel issues, like where they need another shooting forward somewhere in the lineup, and they could use a serviceable third, fourth line player as well. But sort of like what Versteeg was for the Flames last season, just that guy that can kind of bounce all over the lineup and just be effective and the Flames were lacking that player this season. Uh, but beyond that, like the Flames don't have any real glaring areas of weakness where you can point to, like, oh, the, they need a first line forward. They don't, really. It, it Okay, yeah, they need a fourth line, but 
if your season's being lost because your fourth line's bad, like pretty much every team's fourth line is bad. So, like that's not the be all and end all of a season. So like it, it's just so frustrating. It's like it, it'd be one thing like if say the goalie tandem was horrible and you could just say, hey, you know, sort of like fifteen sixteen where Hiller was just so bad that it sunk the season. Like you could say, hey, the Flames weren't really that different other than the fact that the goalie sucked. But there's not yeah, any it gave one us thing. An excuse. Yeah, there's not any one thing that you can point to and say, oh, that's the reason. Well, Matt, with their poor performance this week, if we take a look at where the Flames are now, they are uh, third place out of a wild card spot and at 80 points. Anaheim's at 86 to get in. I was just looking around, and some of the experts have predicted we need 94 points probably to make the playoffs this year, and the Flames have eight games left, which means in order to get to at least that number, the Flames need to win seven of their next eight. And at this point, I think they're going to be lucky. I mean, just looking at how they're playing, not looking at the schedule or anything like that, looking at how they're playing, I think they'll be lucky to win three. Uh, yeah, they'd be more likely to lose seven of the eight than they are to win and it's just frustrating because and you see this is part of the reason why the flames need to actually get off to a hot start in the season and so that way you know what uh, we've been complaining about for years it seems like uh all the way back to like the 90s that the flames have always been somewhat terrible in october and november and uh, that that's the reason why you need to be good right off the hop and bank points early because sometimes stuff like this happens and season like this where like if the Flames had won three or four more games at some various point that we'd be in a playoff spot right now instead of you know needing a miracle like eight game winning streak in the last eight games to get in. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, and we are where we are, but it sucks, and it's not what we expected, and I do think that, and we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks as well, but I think that a lot of hard, I think more hard questions than we've had since probably the year Jerome left have to be asked in this off season. I agree, and it comes down to a fundamental question of what direction do you want this Flames team to be, and like, do you want it to be more... <sighs> sort of like Brian Burke style Kachuk driven team where you know physical in your face you know beat the opposition in the corners and muck it up or do you want to be a finesse team like the Gaudreau style where everybody is a playmaker and you just try to outskill the opposition and part of the problem with the how the flames are currently set up is that they have like half a team of each and you can layer that together to make it work but it, it seems like from a roster point of view they're not really sure what they're doing in terms of what direction that they're trying to achieve and it's, I think Flames management was trying to put together the best players they could find. They weren't necessarily looking at the identity of the organization. They were just saying, this guy's good, and this guy's good, and this guy's good. And now they've got to, like you said, maybe shave some of that fat off and say, this guy's good, but he doesn't fit our model. So let's move him for somebody that does. Yeah, and it, it's easier now that we do have high-quality players that, like, say you want to go whole hog on a – Kachuk style team like it is a, a possibility to move a guy like Goudreau even though like it, that would be a blockbuster deal for to get more of that rugged style of game but th that would of course would depend largely on what you're dealing with but or if you're going the other direction you can make certain deals to move certain players off to go the opposite direction and it's like now that the flames are in the spot they are they have to figure out what they want to do and only that can be an immediate change either i think that might be a two three year change as contracts come off the books i mean you can't just trade everyone that doesn't fit no so i think they they need to decide that and it might be a two three year transitional 
time to get to wherever they want to be. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, like, I'm not really wanting the Flames to make a ton of wholesale changes either. Uh, because I think they need to make at least one big move. I think after a season like this, you kind of have to make a big move to make a statement. Yeah, and I think that uh, in order to solidify this team, that they need to go out and acquire a shooter of some kind. And just somewhere, someone that you can throw out in the power play or, or just to feed off Gaudreau. Uh, just, it doesn't need to be a high, high-end guy, just somebody who can score goals. Because, like, as we've seen with Furland this year, he potted 20 just by being there and able to fire the puck on the net. And I think that anybody that can do well enough at the NHL level, like, say, like, uh, to go back, uh, say, like, if the Flames could acquire somebody like a Curtis Glencross, just somebody who's got... Glencross the free agent. (laughs) Just somebody that can shoot that puck at, at a higher level, even if the rest of their game is just okay... That would be enough, I think, that the Flames could get by. I, I'm i not sure that the Flames need a major, major shakeup. And I... See, the problem is that because of so many players having such down years in terms of their own individual... Like, if you look at shooting percentages, like, everybody's... A good number of them are off their career norms. Those are typically good buy-low candidates. And... I'm reticent to see any of them get dealt just for the fact that I think that they they just struggled mainly because of how the coaching staff situation and like all the other BS happened this year and I I don't know as if the Flames are going to get full value when the players might actually be okay it might just be a coaching issue and that Yeah I- I don't think you necessarily move a guy just to move him, but I think you have to look at the roster. And we'll talk more about this as we get near the end of the season. But I think you move, a, you look at the roster and say, okay, you know, va- defensemen are valuable, goaltenders are valuable. We have lots of those things, so we might have to part with one to get what we need. And that's probably better than if you look at the weak free agent class, overpaying for one of the two or three free agents that might help us out. Oh, I agree, and it. It, it is possible, and especially with a couple of contracts coming off the books and, like, uh, Mason Raymond's buyout, I think, is off this year. Some, you know, there's some money coming off one way or the other that the Flames will have some money where they can spend in free agency, although I think that would be better served as, like, depth players just to solidify that f- third and fourth line. Um, and... I think a a trade of a defenseman for a forward will probably happen. I mean, the Flames have quite a bit of money coming off this year, and since you mentioned it, I'm looking it up here. Stajan comes off, he's $3 million. Rastig comes off, he's almost $2 million. Uh, Chris Stewart, if they don't re-sign him, is another $1 million. Um, Tanner Glass... Tanner Glass is six fifty, Rivik six fifty, dollars uh, Bartkowski is $600, Yager is in there... Uh, he's a million. Dalton Proud is five fifty. So, you know, I mean, they've got probably six million bucks coming off. But you also have to look forward to that next year. There's going to be a big contract to sign in Kachuk, and you got to maybe bank some cap for that as well. True enough. And I think that the Flames may end. This may end up being the year that the Flames have to trade Mark Giordano, just due to the fact of his age, that it not because of the fact that you'd want to, but you could get a good player for him, and you could solve the forward issue by trading him. It wouldn't be my... I think if you trade Geo, though, you might you might solve the forward issue, but now you've weakened your defensive core. I think that there's other pieces we can still trade and get a good return on and not have to move the captain. I know. It, it, a lot of hard questions have to be asked about this team captain's got a no trade too we don't even know if he if he would waive or you know where he'd want to go true enough so matt let me ask you a question here looking back at the starting goaltender over the last week i don't believe mike smith was ready to come back if we look at the play we saw from him and what we've seen not only this season but other seasons i have to think that smitty rushed himself back to try and help his team and i mean he put in 
probably the two worst performances we've seen with him as a Flames goalie. And I don't believe it was just coincidence or his team let him down. Like, I think he's maybe not at 100% still. Yeah, and I think that ideally you want to have your starting goaltender or your all-star starting goaltender to be back in, in game shape for the playoff drive. But it, you could just see that he just didn't seem like he's 100%. And it's frustrating, especially because of the fact that that's what ended up sinking our season. It, it, and if we are going to be a, a playoff team, I would rather have the starter sit out a little bit longer so he's ready for the playoffs than come back early and maybe not be ready and get hurt quicker than he should or something like that. Like I always, when you're relying so much on one goaltender, you really got to be very careful with that guy. Yeah, and especially because of the fact that Gillies and Riddick weren't playing too badly especially in the games prior to Smith coming back, that you could have just ran with them for another handful of days. Like, if, say, the Flames had played Riddick another two or three times, even if Gillies played in one of those games, I think that would have been fine. And I don't see that the Flames' record would have been vastly different. But... You know, if the Flames had won an extra game out of that, then, hey, we'd, we'd still be in it. But it is what it is. Well, on the plus side, somebody get a lot of rest this offseason. True. Um, Matt, looking also this past week, at, we'll talk more about acquisitions and all that stuff. Not that I want to cut you off, but we'll talk more about that as we get near the end of the season. Just kind of want to wrap up what we've seen so far oh, yeah. and look ahead a bit. Um we saw TJ Brody shut down for the Phoenix game. He's apparently injured with an upper body injury and finally saw Rasmus Anderson slot in this year, actually get some play time. We're at that point in the season. If our playoff graphs is, has, uh, or sorry, if our playoff chances have, you know, been out of our grasp now where we might start seeing guys shut, shut down in the lineup and young guys brought in. We've auditioned both of our young goaltenders, who I think will get an audition. We've seen Raz up here need an audition. Who else do you think in the next eight games we might see get an audition? Well, if the Flames sign Adam Fox, whose season is now done with Harvard, I think he'll get a shot. and Bring him up and burn a year. Yep. Uh, the Johnny Gaudreau special. And uh, I think Shillington deserves a shot. And I, I would say Poirier. Yeah, I think Shillington for sure. We need to see what we've got there. I think Poirier, I mean, you know I like Poirier, and I like Poirier's story, and I think Poirier is one of the older guys in the AHL roster, and you got to know if you're going to hang on to him or move on from him shortly. So, yeah, I definitely want to see if he's ready at least. Yeah, and I wouldn't be opposed to Shin Carrick as well, just for that same Shin- reason. Because you saw Klimchuk a little while ago, so bring the other two guys up, see what they have, and... Even if it's just for a couple of games and go from there. Well, and, and, you know, that brings up an interesting point that we're mentioning those three names. And I talked to you a little bit about this before we start recording today. We've got a lot of good defensemen or, you know, maybe not top two guys, but guys you could see as top six defensemen in the NHL in the Flames team right now. We've got a – or in the Flames system. We've got a glut of goaltenders, more than we know what to do with. But we have almost no prospect forwards in the AHL who are probably going to mount anything more than bottom six guys. I mean, if we look around, I think the best we probably got, Mangiapane and maybe Klimchuk down there. And that kind of worries me because without those strong forward candidates, it means if we need a top six guy, we're going to have to either trade or pay for them as a free agent. Yeah, and uh, uh, that is going to be a pressing concern and the flames just simply don't have that uh, that in their system right at the moment and it and without any top picks this year it's not going to get any better no and you just know that with the flames missing the playoffs that we're going to win the draft lottery just because that's the way you know things go in flames land but uh, it, it is frustrating because of the fact that the Flames have hit the mark so often with the defensemen of late that and the goaltending, yet players that they were expecting to do more, like I think that the team expected Klimchuk, Poirier, and 
Christian Carrick to be in the NHL right now. And none of them have taken that next step. And like even at the AHL level, none of them are performing at a level commiserate with, hey, you deserve a call-up. Like Jankowski did. Hathaway did. Even Mangiapane did. But the rest of those guys, just they've kind of flatlined at the A level, and I don't know if they're going to be back. Yeah, on the other side, though, I mean, you know, Hathaway played well in the AHL and deserved the call-up, but I think since he's made the team, he doesn't look like he deserves to be here anymore. So maybe someone will surprise us. Maybe we'll bring up Pori and he'll say, okay, I'm in the big show. I got to do this. I mean, very much like a David Moss who didn't look great. He came here, he had a couple of decent years, and... You know, we might see, I think, you know, Poirier might be somebody like that who can make... I think Poirier is a bottom six guy. I think he'll make this team. But we've got to start cycling more guys through the lineup. Yeah, and I think that with the last handful of games that the Flames need to cycle in a handful of the questionable players to see if they're worth re-signing. And... It, if they show enough at the NHL level, then, hey, you can keep these guys and you might be able to actually rely on them as being an internal option for a fourth-line role next year instead of having to go and sign insert name of miscellaneous Well, I think guy. that's Nick Shore. Yeah. So, you know, and the Flames need to show some trust in their prospects as well. And they've not done that as well so i think that between the two like they need to give players an opportunity and we'll see it, it's interesting if you look at sort of the three positions i think in net we have an open backup spot next year there's two guys fighting for that spot there will be a prospect brought up i think on the blue line we have a prospect ready to be brought up in anderson who we don't have room for so we have to make room for him and then on the forward side, I think we're going to have holes, sort of like you said, but no guys to fill them. So we might have to go out and get filler guys. So it's interesting that, you know, the back end of the ice, which is where the Flames used to be weak, now they're looking very strong. And the forward side, where they used to be pretty strong, now they're looking weak at it. It's like, why can't everything just balance out at the same time? I know. It's frustrating, but uh, that's unfortunately how the cookie crumbles sometimes. And, uh, you know, with this draft, what I'd like the Flames to do because uh, they only have picks from the fourth round on. Take guys that have high-end skill. Who cares what their problem is? <laughs> you know, if they can't skate but they can pass or shoot the puck, whatever their problem is, maybe you can get we can them... We teach to... skating. Yeah, exactly. Whatever their warts are, if they're five foot nothing, who cares <laughs> if you can play and project to be a top six forward at the nhl level hey good and go you know go for hail marys no safe players yeah i also think that as we move forward we're gonna see some prospect deals done i can see the flames potentially moving defensemen or goalies for maybe forward prospects or making that part of a larger deal because i do think that the flames need to get i think with no draft picks really that are going to be of much substance this year, they're going to have to get some quick um, prospects into the system. And realistically, I don't see that happening. I think the only way that they're going to get some infusion of forward talent is through signing UFA prospects, like the NCAA or Euro free agents. And I think that the Flames would be a very good market for that because of the fact that hey, our third and fourth line are kind of terrible, and if you play at an NHL level, you're going to get in. Yeah, but when can we also go to those free agents and say, look, here's the last UFA forward who we brought in who made a dent here, Trevanka. I mean, we brought in, what was his name, McBain since then, and he didn't do a dang thing. Like, we don't have a good record of converting forwards from Europe onto our lineup. Well, true, but, you know, when you got David Wolf. That's that was his name. Yeah, I when you said McBean, I'm like, yeah, that's David Wolf. But you know, I forgot the guy's name, but I just remember you and I saw him at uh, rookie camp, and he looked like McBean from The Simpsons. I know he literally looked like a walking refrigerator. Just okay, so let's play some hockey. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, but, you know, it, it also brings up the discussion of who might turn pro and what might we have coming up through our own ranks. So, Matt, I looked at the Flames prospects, guys who aren't playing pro in either the AHL or the ECHL, and I have seven names here of guys who I think might turn pro this year. Some guys have to turn pro just because of their age. But why don't we go through these guys um, and we'll give our thoughts on if we think that they could turn pro and based on what we're seeing, maybe some projections for their future. Uh-huh. The first guy is a guy that I kind of feel sorry for turning pro when he is, and that's Nick Schneider, a goaltender from Leduc who currently plays for the uh, for the Calgary Hitmen. And I just, when I look at this kid, I think, you know what? he's coming into probably the worst time to be a Flames goaltender prospect because he's going to end up as the ECHL backup. There's nowhere else to put the kid. Yeah, I, I think that Schneider will end up getting dealt in like a contract-for-contract contract type trade at some point in the offseason just for that strict fact because it's not fair to him that, you know, hey, you're going to basically play 10 games in the ECHL next year. Have fun. Like, but I'm at sure the same that time, if that happens, that I'm not going to lose any sleep. Yeah, it, I'm sure there's some team that has a depth forward prospect that, hey, you know, or something. Yeah. No, I wouldn't lose any sleep if Schneider gets dealt. I think that looking at him and looking at the rest of our goaltending core, I was kind of surprised when they signed Schneider to start with. But from what we've seen at rookie camps and even watching him in the WHL, I'm not convinced this guy is much of a future. AHL depth guy, that's probably about it. Yeah, and he did well enough in uh, that one um, training camp, and uh, he did play well enough against the Flames players that that turned some heads just because of the fact that he was stopping players like Gaudreau, but, you know, he, he must have been just having a good week. Yeah, I think, too, the question is how much compete level does some of the veterans bring there as well? Sure. The next guy on our list, a guy I'm pretty sure is going to turn pro, if for no other reason than his age. I believe he's uh, 20. Yeah, he's 20 now, so he's going to age out of the WHL. But a guy who's been in a couple training camps, we've seen him a few times, you and I. He was drafted in 2015 in the fourth round by St. Louis. Calgary's been interested for a few years, and that's Glenn Godden, and a guy who's tearing up the WHL. He had 125 total points this year in 67 games, so almost two points a game that's impressive yep and he's a very smart player and that's part of the reason why the flames signed him i don't think that he's at a level where you could say that this guy has top six potential but he might be smart enough as a hockey player to eventually work his way into like a third fourth line center type of role a defensive yeah i think I think Gordon's a guy who will be around the NHL for a while. I sort of project his career as being a guy who, sort of like a Chris Beach type who just kind of gets traded, or a Brad Moran type who sort of gets traded from organization to organization, even like a Scotty Upshaw. Everybody wants them because they're a good player. They're a good depth guy, but they never really last anywhere because, you know, you can easily replace them with the next kid that comes through. Yep. I agree. You know, he, and I think he'll probably get more looks than he deserves after the great season he's had. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with him. But, you know, I think time will tell when we see him in the AHL how well he translates to the pro game. Yeah, and the next season will pretty much give you the all you need to know about God. And if he translates well and gets, like, north of 30 points, then you know you have an NHL player there. If he is like at like 15 to 20 points, then it, probably not. And I know points aren't everything, but, you know, it does help to separate just because, you know, points usually come from playing well. Yeah, it's the easiest. And, and I mean, especially for a guy who's got points like that in the dub, they're going to expect him to be a point producer in the AHL. Yeah. The next guy is a guy the Flames drafted in 2017 in round five, and that's Zach Fisher, 20 year old. He's uh, six foot one, 196 pounds. Again, turning pro probably simply for the fact that he's going to age out of the dub. 
I'm not really sure what to expect with Zach Fisher. This is a guy who I think will probably project to be like a Brett Pollock, probably jump around the ECHL, the AHL. I don't see an NHL future for this guy, but he's a guy that I think we could see almost like Watherspoon hang around here until past the expiry date just because he's a good hand. Yeah, and he doesn't mind roughing it up, and that helps as well, especially at the AHL level. So, I mean, you, you watched him in his draft year before he got drafted. Any thoughts on what we've seen from him so far? His production went way down this year. Yeah, I don't – I really don't know – I don't think he has any NHL upside in terms of being more than like a 13th forward, but I think he's just basically going to be like the next Hunter Smith, just that guy who throws the body around and – doesn't mind fighting every once in a while not your prototypical ahl fourth liner finishing off the forward ranks here and then we'll move on to the defenseman uh dylan dubay he was drafted in the in 2016 in the second round by the flames guy has been pretty consistent at the ahl or the whl level he put up big numbers this year 84 points with Kelowna, where he wore the a I think Dubé's got some potential. I don't think he's necessarily a top six guy, but there's a guy that I could see as a centerman making the team. And my prediction with Dubé is he takes Furlan's spot when I think Furlan leaves the team next year. Yeah, that's possible. I Another very smart player, and he, the player that Dubé reminds me the most of is Damon Lanko, where just a very smart player, player knows where he needs to be to generate offense not gonna blow you away with the size his speed his shot any one of his skills but he just does everything well and he's very responsible defensively and i think that he will be an nhler over the long term what line that just depends on how his offense translates i think that he'll be an nhl regardless but he may only be like a third fourth line guy if his offense doesn't translate well it's funny you mentioned Lanko. when i watch him play i see paul byron like i almost see a spitting image of a younger version of paul byron in him yeah i could see maybe that. it's his size i don't know yeah um so yeah i think dubay has nhl potential i think it'll be up to him to like you said what line he's on i wouldn't expect this guy to project to be top six but I just think that he could be sort of that – he can play wing. He can, you know, play wing quite well, and I think that he might make the team just because of that, that he might be the next sort of winger in line. And it is possible if he has a good training camp next year that he could make the team out of camp. It is possible. Yeah. Of any of the players that are in this list, he's the one likeliest to go. I think there's one above him we'll talk about in a bit. I think Dubé needs some AHL season. Same here, but, but he could. The next guy, a guy who's already signed by the Flames, who they signed this year is Matthew Phillips. He's been playing the, as the captain for the Victoria Royals and got 112 points this year in the dub. Nice kid. You and I have talked a lot with him at training camps and rookie camps. He's five foot seven. I think that's probably the biggest knock on him as to why he may not make the NHL. Yeah, skill wise, he he would be one of the most skilled players in the organization and NHL level down. It's just can he overcome his size? And in the games that he's played against bigger opponents and better opponents, he's kind of disappeared. And I think that it, the AHL next year will be telling for Phillips if he disappears. I would be shocked just because of the fact that he might just be sized out of professional hockey, which would suck because of the fact that he is a very skilled player. It, he will be, it'll be interesting to see his point totals because like if he's only like say 12 or 15 points, then you know he's really not adapting to the pro game. If he continues on where he should be based on his skill level then he'll be like le near the lead of the team i hate to say it i would almost consider starting him in the echl just to give him a little bit of oomph and maybe put him on a big scoring streak 
Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea. I also think that Phillips and his play could directly affect Mangiapani. I see them as the same kind of player, and I think one of them is going to potentially make the NHL with the Flames, not maybe next year, but in a couple of years, and one's not. So I think that if Phillips plays really well, it could sort of move Mangiapani down the depth chart. Well, it makes sense. They were both picked with the same pick, so... They're both within three inches of each other, too. They're both that. I think you've got room for one kind of guy like that, and that's why I think that they might affect each other. Yeah. Well, now let's move on to the defensemen. And when you said that uh, Dubé was the guy you thought was closest to being ready, I think it could be Yuso Valamaki. Apparently the Flames are really high on this guy. They think he's ready. I personally think Yuso is almost like the defensive version of Jankowski, where he's going to be a bit of a longer-term project. But apparently the Flames almost wanted to bring him in out of training camp this year. And if the Flames trade a defenseman in the offseason, Valimaki makes the NHL. Uh, I'm not even going to... To me, there, I don't see any debate on that uh, just because of the fact that you're, you've got somebody who's tearing up the WHL and... Even if it's just as the number six defenseman, I think that he'll make You think he makes it in over Raz? Probably, yeah. See, I think that sets a bad, again, going back to the HR thing about this organization, I think that sets bad precedent that, hey, you're a pro, you're doing awesome, but we're going to bring a kid in and jump him ahead of you. I think job one has to go to Raz, job two goes to Valimaki if they open up a second job. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. I don't know exactly... Yeah, you're right. It's just... You know, if depends. I was Raz, I'd be upset at that point. I might even want to get out of here. Like, if you're not if you're not valuing me and you're putting this guy in front of me, screw you. Well, it's one of those things that Rasmus Anderson's foot speed might hold him back. And that's... You know, because that game against Arizona... I don't know. We had Derek England on this team for how many years who didn't have great foot speed? He... Well... Yeah, it's one of those things that that could be the deciding factor. And we'll see. It'll be an interesting storyline for September. I think the best thing for Valimaki, like, and you know my thoughts on this, I, I believe that there's very few players who should make the jump from junior or college right to the NHL. I think the best thing for Valimaki is bring him in, give him Raz's position in the A, give him that you know top pairing minute, and let him earn his way up next year. Say, that, you know, we'll make a job if you're ready, but start him in the A. Yep, not opposed to it. And the big wild card here, I think maybe the most interesting prospect on this list, but the guy who's the biggest wild card is five foot eleven defenseman Adam Fox. He's still playing in university for Harvard. Their season is over. And the big question is, will he sign this year, as Matt mentioned earlier? And if he does, he probably burns his junior year by playing one game here. Yeah, and I think that the Flames need to get him under contract, especially with the logjam with the five defensemen under contract already, and then you got the three main prospects. Getting him in the fold so that way he doesn't just wait out the clock to UFA, I think that's the important thing. We'll see, though. Matt, I, I agree with you about Fox, and I think if Fox turns pro, which I think he's going to, my issue there becomes we have way too many guys in the AHL who might have some value of turning pro. We've got Olus Matson, we've got Fox, we've got uh, Shillington, we've got Anderson, we've got Valimaki. Like, that's just too many defensemen. They're not all going to get to play enough. So I think if Fox comes in, you really then are forced to graduate someone to the NHL or move them out of the lineup. Yeah move them to another organization yeah and i think that's why the flames will have to shake up their defense core at least moving one of the five if not two of the five just like if they could say trade uh stone as well i think that might be a prudent idea just due to the fact that you have so many guys that are looking nhl ready and it, we just have to start cycling people through it's one of those good problems to have. We have too many good defensemen. So let's move things along so that way the team can improve overall. The Flames signed uh, Cody Golubov. I think it was only for this season, but I would not be surprised at all if Golubov becomes our number seven next year. Yeah, I could see that. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting as we talked about that there's so much defensive depth. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping a lot of these guys do turn pro. I, I think most of them probably will. I think some of them are going to struggle with the pro game, and it'll be interesting to see how the Flames utilize both the AHL and ECHL rosters for that. Well, Matt, anything else you want to talk about, or should we get to our polls? Just get to the polls, and that way we can wrap this one up and look forward to some more Flames hockey next week. We asked you guys last week, what needs to be changed in the offseason? What do you think needs to be changed about the Flames? And you could select as many options as you wanted to, and the results are in. It was pretty close. Um, 27% of respondents said we should be firing the head coach. 24% of respondents said the Flames need to make a big trade or two. 24% of the respondents said we need to move out some dead weight and promote AHL talent. 16% of people said it's time to fire the general manager. 2% said it's time to go UFA shopping. I think when we remember back to the Brower signing, nobody wants that again. And two per, and 5% of people said it's time for a full rebuild. And when I saw that number, I cringed. I really don't want to go through that again. No, especially this team isn't that bad. It, it, it'd be different if, like, the Flames only had two or three players that were actually doing anything, and like the Oilers, and then the rest of the team was not doing anything. But the Flames have, like, nine or ten players that are actually performing at a good level, so that's easy to fix. It's when you only have, like, three that you have problems. Well, Matt, this week we're going to ask the fans... How how interested are you in the rest of the Flame season? Will you be watching the rest of the games from here on out? Are you going to watch them all live? Do you think maybe you'll check the score on your phone and tune in if it's uh, if the Flames are winning? Will you PVR them and watch them if you get time? Or are you just done? Are you going to check the score on your phone and not listen to any more of the games? We'll be curious to see what you guys think about the remainder of the season and how engaged you are at this point. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are just done. Mm-hmm. So, as always, you can answer the poll on our Facebook page. We're facebook.com slash fireside chat. On Twitter, we're at fireside podcast. You can answer it on our website at firesidechat.ca. And I do want to let everyone know we now have an Instagram account. We're fireside chat underscore podcast. So, hit us up on Instagram. We got some cool stuff coming up there. Uh, you can't do the poll on Instagram, but we're going to have some cool stuff coming up. So make sure you follow us. Last week, we were posting some cool pictures from the press box and at ice level of the dome that are only on our Instagram feed. So go check those out. Well, Matt, let's look ahead. It's uh, kind of sad to do this, but we got three games between now and when we'll probably record next. The Flames have a home game against Anaheim. And just on that note, I guess the only thing we could really say this season was good for is we finally broke the curse. Yeah. Um, but this time Anaheim's in Calgary. Then we've got a road game against San Jose and matinee game on Saturday at 2 p.m. And then the Flames take on the LA Kings at an 8.30 p.m. That's a late start. That's probably the latest start of the season on Monday. Um, what are your thoughts for this week? Zero points. You think they blow them yep. all? Do you think they're ever going to get a win again before the season's over? Uh, they might win one or two. But uh, I think they will probably beat Edmonton and Arizona, and that'll be it. So They just proved they can't beat Arizona. Well, I don't think that will happen again. But I think that maybe one or two more wins the rest of the way. I, just your voice when we got to this sounds like a defeated man. Yeah, well, it is what it is. You know, the season's basically done. The Flames need to win all eight games in order to even have a shot, and even then I doubt it. So... Yeah, it's not too good. So, Well, let's pray to the hockey gods, sacrifice to Lanny's mustache, whatever we got to do, and see if they can pull out a miracle. But even if they do, I think they get probably swept in the first round with how this season's yeah. going. If they do somehow fluke their way into a playoff spot, Nashville's just going to murder them. The only good thing is it means we don't give a lottery pick to the Islanders. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm just hoping that the fl- – Flames pick does not end up being one of the top three picks. That didn't that happen last year? Like the the um, Philadelphia Flyers barely missed, and then they got number yeah. two. Well, that's what I'm hoping for is that the Flames pick does just because of the fact that I don't want to hear about oh the Flames could have had Brady Kachuk or Rasmus Dolan, but instead, you know, just because you know, like who needs to? <laughs> it's bad enough. Well, the Flames aren't going to get Dolan. The Oilers are going to win the lottery again. The lottery's built for the Oilers. True. 
That's the highlight of their I still believe all the balls say Oilers on them. I think they just, you know, make it up when another... Oh, the Oilers have already been picked. Uh, The Golden Seals. Oh, wait, they're not around anymore. Uh, Nordiques. Oh, wait, who have we got? So, I I don't know. I think all the balls just permanently say Edmonton. Well... Which is very different than I thought. I thought Vegas would be in that position. Yeah. Well, I'm just hoping that the Flames can have a decent end to their season and figure things out in the off season. I want to see some young guys. I want to see even guys like Shore and potentially uh, Stewart if they want to resign them, get in the lineup, and maybe do some radical changes. I mean, just try putting these lines in a blender and let's do something different. Yep. Because doing the same isn't working for us. All right, Matt, we'll enjoy these three games. Hopefully there's something to enjoy. I'll be at the Anaheim game tomorrow. I'll be tweeting and putting up stuff from on Instagram from there, and uh, hopefully the Flames are pissed off enough they can come home and get a win. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.